Chapter 29 is the closing of Moses speaking this covenant. If you remember, this, uh, this is Moses kind of giving his last words to the children of Israel before they pass on to the promised land. And he himself goes and dies. The Lord, of course, um, takes him home here in the next couple of chapters. And the kind of the closing chapters are a little bit more, the last few chapters, more poetic. We, uh, some things to look forward to as well. But this is the closing of, of the covenant that Moses began to speak in the, in the land of Moab. That's what it says there in verse 1. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant he made with them in Horeb. So if you recall, of course, Horeb is referring to uh, the Ten Commandments when they came out of Egypt. That was the name of the mount. Another name for that mount is Mount Sinai, where God came down in a pillar of fire and smoke and all of that. And they received the commandments at that time. But, you know, there's a lot more to what God had to say. God didn't just sum everything up there. He had a lot more than he wanted to add. And he adds those things uh, here in uh, this, this latter part where they come into the land of Moab just before they pass over. Now, a lot of the things he said, of course, were repeated. He did repeat himself. But there's also a lot of other things. And if you were with us as we were going through the book of Deuteronomy, we see that God has concerned himself really with every aspect of human life. I mean, if, we've, if we can recall some of the passages that we've looked at, these chapters over, uh, you know, the la- these last months, uh, I mean, there's just no part of, of a society that God just doesn't put his finger in and say, this is the way it's going to be done. This is the way I want it done. And God, what shows us is that God concerns himself with human affairs. You know, God isn't just, you know, this passive observer who just, you know, he's, it's not like the Bette Midler song, you know, and everyone who knows that, you know, from a distance, you know, God is watching us. You know, that's a lie, Bette Midler. You know, God isn't watching us from a distance. You know, God is involved. You know, God wants to, uh, you know, he looks into the things of man, and, he, and, he, and he's even spoken to man, you know, through Moses, through his word. You know, God's not just this mysterious figure that we have to, you know, stumble through the darkness and try to find. God is very open about who he is and that he's there. You know, he, he's saying, you know, you know if, if we would seek and call after him, you know, we would find him. <laughs> but that's what we see here in the book of Deuteronomy. God dealing with mankind, telling him how society is out of run. I mean, he just, again, we won't go over all of it, but just every single thing in society God dealt with, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so, again, God isn't just this passive observer. But, uh, you know, and this has kind of been a theme throughout this book is accountability. You know, the themes of accountability, the themes of obedience and blessing. I mean, that's really been a theme throughout the book of Deuteronomy. So often God is saying, you know, if you do this, I'll bless you. If you do this, I'll curse you. If you don't do this, I'll curse you. If you don't do this, I'll bless you. And so on and so forth. So I think accountability has been a major theme of this book. If we've paid attention to that or, or caught these previous uh, sermons, we, we would know that. But, um, you know, God is making these people, the children of Israel, even more accountable, that's what we see here, by the fact that he has worked in their presence. You know, and we, this, we can apply that to ourselves as well. We're saved, we know the truth, we have the Holy Spirit, we have a, uh, you know, we have a church that we can go to where we hear biblical preaching. These things are a blessing, no doubt. But they're also, these are things that make us more accountable to God. These are things that are going to, God is going to hold us to a higher degree of accountability than the person who does not have those things. <clears throat> and I've preached, you know, in previous chapters of Deuteronomy through that. But that is a consistent theme throughout. And we find that again here in this chapter as well. In fact, that's what Moses starts doing here in the beginning of verse 2. He reminds them of their accountability to God because of the fact that he has, they have seen God work in their midst. And they've also, seen, they've also had to rely on God for his protection and for his provision. You'll see that there in verse 2 where it says, And Moses called unto all Israel and said to them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land. The great temptations with thine eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles. Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And I have led you. Forty years in the wilderness, your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and your shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. I mean, that's one of those little miracles that we so often, you know, overlook. We could talk about all the ones that were previously mentioned here, about all the plagues of Egypt, all the miracles of Egypt, all the great temptations that they came through, 
I mean, there's all these great miracles in that story that Moses could have brought up, right? I mean, he kind of just glosses over them very quickly and says, hey, you've seen all these things. You know what we're talking about. But then he points out there specifically, look, you know, uh, your, your clothes are not waxen old and your shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. You know, I don't think that, you know, obviously they probably weren't bringing a full wardrobe with them. It's not like they had, you know, just you know, walking through the desert with Samsonite, you know, luggage and everything like that. They probably only had maybe the clothes on their back, maybe a few other garments, you know, maybe only one or two pairs of shoes. You know, and, and it's an amazing miracle is that throughout 40 years, those things never wore out. And that's just one of those things that we kind of look over. And what's interesting, too, is that those are the two things that, uh, one of the two things that God has promised to provide us even in the New Testament. You know, Jesus said, you know, that he's promised food and raiment. Paul said that having food and raiment, let us be there with content. You know, those are the two things that God has promised us. You know, the raiment, and he goes on there and says in verse 6, Ye have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong Greek, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So if you recall in the 40 years of the wilderness, they were eating manna every morning, right? And he's saying, look, you didn't eat bread. You didn't have anything uh, nice to drink. You know, you were just drinking, you know, plain water and things like that. And they were, you know, we would look at that and say, man, that's kind of lean. You know, it's kind of, God wasn't exactly feeding them, you know, flame and young every, every morning. It wasn't a porterhouse every night for them to, before they went to bed. It was the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again for so many years. And, and, and we would look at that and say, well, that doesn't sound very pleasant, but what was the purpose behind it? That ye might know that I am the Lord your God. And I mean, that should be, that would be worth it right there. I mean, to know that you, are, you, uh, that you uh, know the very God of heaven, that, you know, it's not so much what you're being given as much as who it's giving it, who's giving it to you. So, you know, sometimes even in our own life, God will keep us lean. You know, maybe we have to eat, you know, things get tight and we have to start just eating, you know, the rice, the beans, the noodles, you know, the canned goods, you know, whatever. You know, we're not going to have the, the, the full course meal, you know, every other, you know, it's not going to be, you know, crepes and, and everything else for breakfast. You know, it might just be toast I and mean, maybe a little bit of butter. You know, there's been seasons probably in all of our lives where we've had to have some, you know, some scarcity. We had to go through and, you know, things were tight, you know, but God does that sometimes so that we learn to rely on him. And I believe that's what Moses is reminding them of here. Look, you had food and you had raiment and the Lord is your God. And that's really what matters the most. And he says in verse 7, And when you came unto this place, Sion king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan came out against us unto battle, and we smote them. And we took their land and gave it for an inheritance of the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Of course, if you recall, they had much cattle. They liked that land there. They made a covenant with the, uh, the other tribes that they would leave their children there and, and their cattle, and they would go fight with them, and they would not return until all the land was taken. If we're familiar with that story. But again, what are we seeing here? That God is providing for them, and God is also protecting them. And the theme, the reason why, it's not that they forgot all this. Moses is reminding them of this because what he's trying to make the impression here in this chapter is that, yes, God has done all these for, things for you, but that only makes you all the more accountable for the things, that, uh, for having witnessed these things. And really what he's trying to do, because you've got to remember, God knows the beginning from the end. God knows the land that they're going into is a land that floweth of milk and honey. As it says in Joshua, he's going to give them a land which they did not labor for, cities which he built not, and ye shall dwell in them. Of the vineyards and the olive yards which ye planted not, do ye eat. So they were about to go in and run out the inhabitant of that land, the Canaanites, and take over. And they were already going to have homes and vineyards and, and olive yards and all these things just ready to go. And God, of course, at that time quit feeding them uh, the manna from heaven because they had the fruit of the land. God knows that the abundance and the wealth that they're about to come into. And God, I believe, is trying to remind them of the dangers of prosperity. And that's a very real thing. And if you would turn over to Proverbs chapter 30, keep something in chapter 29. And that's something we always have to be on guard about. And I believe that's probably one of the bigger problems this nation has had. Uh, you know, is it possible for a nation to be prosperous and not forget God? Sure. But is that the tendency in man? No. The tendency with man is that the more he has in abundance, the more he has of this world's goods, the less he seems to need God. The less dependent he is likely to become of, upon God. And that can, in fact, happen to an entire nation as, as well as individuals. And I believe that's what he's trying to warn them about. 
That's what he's going into in this chapter. He's reminding all the things that God did, did, all the protection, all the provision, so that when they come into this land, they're not going to forget the Lord their God. <clears throat> it says there in Proverbs chapter 30, look at verse 7, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Reef far from me vanity and lies, and give me neither poverty nor riches. You know, that's a good prayer to pray in life. Say, you know, I don't need a lot. You know, of course, we don't want to be dirt. We don't need to pray and ask God to make us dirt poor. And a lot of people have this false, uh, you know, this false humility. You know, if they, the, the more, if they just make themselves poor. I mean, you think about the monk and things like that and, and the, you know, the, the different monasteries and things where they give up everything they own and they, they, you know, they wear one robe with a, a rope for a belt or something like that, you know, and they, they live a very austere life. But really, that's just a thing of pride. It's, a very, it's an outward show of some false, austere you know, lifestyle, just this false humility they're trying to put out there. Look at me, how poor I am. I'm so godly, I'm so holy because I've made myself destitute. Okay? We shouldn't desire that. We shouldn't get caught up in this thing of the more we afflict ourselves, you know, somehow that's going to make us holy. Now, of course, you know, if affliction comes and suffering comes, that does make us better. But it should be something that happens in and of itself or something that, that God ordains. It shouldn't be something we seek out. So because he's saying here, give me neither poverty, but then he says, nor riches. You know, riches are another thing we have to be very careful about. You know, if we have an abundance of wealth, and I talked about this, I believe, just this last Sunday or perhaps last week. I can't remember which sermon it was. I won't go on about it, but in the Bible, you know, yeah, it was this last Sunday we, we preached about, uh, you know, uh, envy, yeah, covetousness. You know, we, if we, a lot of times when people come into a lot of money, that can be very bad. And I'm not saying everybody. I'm mean, saying some people can probably handle it. But the vast majority of people that come into wealth, you know, sometimes that's their undoing. So this is a good prayer here. Don't give me poverty. Don't give me riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. And he's not talking about 7-Eleven. You know, he's not talking about convenience store food. He's saying feed me with food that is appropriate, you know. Maybe I don't have to have the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the glazed duck, you know, or whatever, you know, but maybe I can have, you know, something good. I can have something that's just going to be, you know, get the job done, fill me, give me some food. <clears throat> but what, again, Moses is doing here is warning them of the dangers of prosperity. And <clears throat> what we're seeing, the theme of this chapter and really the whole book of Deuteronomy, for, by and large, is that God's blessing is dependent upon our obedience. You know, the saying that we've heard and, you know, it rings true and it's something that we should think about often is that the path uh, to God's blessing is through the door of obedience. You know, how are you going to give God's blessing in our life? We're going to do it by obeying his commandments. You know, it's great that we're saved. It's great that, you know, Jesus, you know, uh, paid it all. You know, that salvation is a free gift that we don't have to do anything for it. But does that, that does not necessarily mean that our lives are going to be blessed of God. Just because you get saved doesn't mean that, Somehow God is just going to, you know, sprinkle some fairy dust on your life and everything's going to go great and you don't have to, you have no part to play. You know, we do have a part to play if we want the blessing of God in our life. And that's what we're seeing here in this chapter. If you look there in verse 9, he says, <coughs> excuse me, keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that ye do. So a lot of people that, you know, they get it backwards. They think, well, you know, I can, if I want to prosper, then I have to ignore the things of God. You know, if I want to make money and succeed and work, you know, then I'm going to have to work overtime and work Sundays, and I don't have time for soul winning. I'm not, you know, I'm going to be too busy to read my Bible. I'm going to be too busy to do all these things because I need to prosper. Well, the Bible's teaching us the exact opposite is what's true, that if we want to prosper in all that we do, then we need to keep the words of his covenant, that we need to do his commandments. Not just keep them, but do them. So that's, a, again, the principle that, that is, is the overarching theme here, is, is obedience and blessing. Now, another interesting thing here in this chapter is that, beginning in verse 10, we see that God does not limit his covenant to a certain bloodline. You know, God doesn't limit uh, who his people are to a certain race or to a certain group of people, Okay. And, you know, that would, that's something that we need to touch upon every time we come across it because of the fact that, you know, this, doc, this, this Zionist thinking, you know, this, this dispensational doctrine that's out there that teaches, you know, that the Jews are God's chosen people and we as Gentile believers are just, you know, we're, we're just catching God on the rebound kind of a thing. You know, God came and he was rejected of them and then God just kind of threw up his hands and said, well, I guess the Gentiles will do. 
That's not at all the case. You know, then trying to turn God's, God's people, God's true chosen people, and trying to make them to feel like some kind of second-class citizen when the exact opposite is what's true. And that's what we see here. We see even an example of that, as well as many other places in scriptures where God does not limit who his people are to a certain you know, genetic pool of people. It's to all people. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that he's the savior of all men, that, uh, of them that believe. So if you look there in uh, verse 10, it says, Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of wood unto the drawer of water, that thou shouldest enter into the covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh thee, excuse me, make with thee this day, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, that he may be unto thee a God, as he saith unto thee, and as he hath sworn of thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So again, God is including people here that would later be considered Gentiles. If you, and you're saying, well, who are you talking about? Well, it's interesting there in verse 11, he says, the stranger that is in thy camp. Okay, that right there should be a clue. Now, he's not talking about the weirdo. Okay, that's not what he means by stranger. You know, the, the odd guy in your camp, that's not what that means. When he says stranger, he's saying the foreigner. That's, another, that's the biblical word for foreigner. Somebody is from another country. You know, they're not native-born to Israel. He's saying, look, they're, they're part of the people that were gathered there that day that God entered into a covenant with and called Abraham and Isaac and Jacob their fathers. He also said, the hewer of thy wood and the drawer of thy water. And we know uh, later that that would actually be the inhabitants of Gibeon. You know, if we recall the story when Joshua went into the land and started to overtake the land, the, 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 the inhabitants of Gibeon, the Gibeonites, they saw what was happening and they deceived the children of Israel. Remember, they... You know, they made them, uh, they, they, they got moldy bread and they put on their old worn out clothes and they took their, their wine skins that were worn out and they said they were journeying from a far country, that they had heard tale of them from a great land far off, that they weren't in the Canaanites and they entered into a, a covenant of peace with them. And then later when it's found out, what does Joshua do? He tells them, hey, you know what? You, you guys deceived us, you were treacherous, but Here's the thing, we can't, we've made a covenant with you and we can't break it, but now you're going to be our hewers of wood and our drawers of water. And I believe God foresaw that. You know, God foresaw that even the people that are going to be hewing your wood and drawing your water, they too are going to enter into the covenant. And who were they? They were the very people of the land that God was casting out. They, were, they lived in Canaan. They were to be destroyed, but because of what they did, they, you know, they, they found a loophole and managed to make their way in. And God says, well, they're going to enter into my covenant too. <clears throat> and God even goes so far, I believe in this passage, he's alluding to future generations that aren't even there yet. I believe that, you know, we would see ourselves in that. And he goes on to include future, future generations. That's what he says um, uh, g g later down here in the, in the chapter. <clears throat> but first of all, I mean, just again, touch on this. You know, he's saying the stranger that is in thy camp. That is something, you, you know, we see... In Numbers, you see that in Esther, uh, in, in chapter 8, when, in the, the, when God grants deliverance to the Jews and, and they decree the law that the Jews could defend themselves against their enemies. And the people that were, you know, uh, you know of the Gentile nations were so afraid that it says in Esther that uh, uh, many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews. So how do you become a Jew if being a Jew is just genetic? You know, you can't do that. It's because being a Jew is a religious thing. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not this genetic thing. It's, it's what you believe, not, you know, your DNA, Amen. okay? So we see that even all the way back in the Old Testament, it was possible to become a Jew even if you were a Gentile, if you were not of the nation of Israel, you know, genetically, if you weren't a descendant directly. But he no again, he notices, he, he talks about the hewers of the wood, you know, referring to the, uh, the, uh, the inhabitants of Gibeon, I believe, and I believe the Gibeonites, you know, God foresaw them, and he mentions them there, the hewers of wood and, and the drawers of water. But I also believe that he is also referring to us today. That God, when he says, you know, those that, uh, that, that aren't even here today, he goes on and, and, and says, <coughs> that they also would be of the covenant. Look there in verse 14. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and oath, 
but with him that standeth here uh, with that before us uh, this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. You know, I, I don't know that there were just, you know, people, maybe there were some God, people that were supposed to be there that were gone. I tend to think what he's referring to is the fact that there's going to be future generations that come, and that would include us. And you see that again, you know, in Matthew, you don't have to go there, but go over to 1 Peter chapter 2, a very familiar passage. But in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus said, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and from the west, and shall sit down with who? With Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what's Jesus teaching here? He's teaching, like, look, there's going to be strangers to the nation of Israel that come down and sit down with your progenitors, your patriarchs, and you yourselves are going to be cast out. And, of course, if you recall the story, that's, you know, he, he gives that in the midst of uh, the story with the, the uh, Roman centurion, you know, who... Who, who Jesus says, I, I've not found so great a faith in all of Israel. He said that of a Roman, a Roman soldier. <clears throat> so what we see is that God's intent with Old Testament Israel has, in fact, let me just say this, God's intent with his people throughout all time, whether it's in the Old Testament or today, God has always had the same purpose in mind for his people. Okay? And what that purpose is, is that those, his people would be a lighthouse unto all nations. That, is, that was the intent that God had with the nation of Israel, that they were to be a light unto the Gentiles. You know, you read about that in Isaiah chapter 42. He said, I have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will help thee to give thee for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles. I mean, they were supposed to have law. If they, were, if they had kept the commandments and the covenants the way they should have, the Bible says that people would have wondered at their law, that they would have been drawn to inquire of the God of Israel when they saw the blessing that God would have poured out upon that nation. And in fact, there was a time when that happened, if you recall, with Solomon, when he had the peace in his land for, it was 40 years, and he had all that abundance, and, 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 and God had just poured out his blessing upon that nation at that time. What did we see? We saw Queen of Sheba coming and wanting to inquire, right? We saw people coming from different parts of the world. But that has always been God's intent. You know, that's, that's what God wants for his people to be. God wants us to be a lighthouse to all nations. God's not trying to make this exclusive club. You know, people get it backwards. They think that God, want, God took the Jews and just made them this, you know, you know, this, this elitist group of people that, that nobody can be else can be a part of. You know, much like the nation of Israel tries to do today, right? You know, they, you can't come in unless you, you know, your mother was born a Jew or something like that. I don't, I don't know the, the law of... Uh, it's escaping me now, the, 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 the right of return and things like that. They have this whole big, you know, rigmarole that you have to go through. And not everybody gets in, right? But that's not the Old Testament Israel. That's not the biblical Israel. That's not what God intended for the true Israel of God, that they would be this exclusive club that nobody else could be a part of. No, it was quite the opposite. God wanted them to have, you know, to be open to allow many people to come in to allow all nations to flow into them and to be, and to be saved and to, to know the God of Israel. <clears throat> you know, today, we are that light. We are that, that nation. We are that peculiar people. And we, are to, we have the same purpose today as Old Testament Israel did, to be a light unto the Gentiles. You see that in 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 9. He said, Ye are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what we're supposed to do. That's, what, that's the purpose of us being a peculiar people. That's the purpose of us being this holy nation or this royal, uh, royal priesthood. It's not so we can walk around and strut our stuff and say, look how special we are. Now, we are special, but, you know, but because of Christ, not because of our own goodness, because of the fact that he died for us and we have put our faith in him, but the purpose that we have is not to, you know, try to, uh, you know, stick our, our noses three feet up in the air and pretend that we're better than everybody. The purpose, he says there, is to show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the purpose, that we would show forth those praises that when people would hear of the God of Israel, they would hear about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and they would want to part in that, and that they would get saved. And look at verse 10. He says, Which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 
And there's one word I'd really like to emphasize in that verse, and it's the word the. Look there. He says, which in times past were not a people, but now are what? The people of God. Not, not a, a people of God. Not, you know, Israel and then the Gentiles too. No, we are the people of God to the exclusion of anybody else. And again, not because of our own goodness, but because we've been saved, because we've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is open to everybody. You know, everybody has that opportunity, if they want it, to be that part of that peculiar people, to be part of that holy nation, to be the people of God. <clears throat> and go back to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 29, where we were, we'll pick it back up in verse 16. He says in verse 16, For you know how you have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which were our, ye passed by, and ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone and silver and gold, which were among them, lest there should be any man or woman or, uh, uh, or, woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God. So God's saying, look, what, el what else is making them accountable? Not just the fact that you know, God's protected them, God has provided for them, they've seen all these miracles that God has done. But he's also saying, look, you've also passed, you've dwelt in Egypt and you've passed by these other nations and you've seen the abominations. You know, you've seen the alternative to following the Lord your God. You know, sometimes we should be able to look at what other, the mistakes other people are making and that should be enough for us to learn our lesson. Not to say, well, let me go see if that's how it's going to work out with me. You know, we see somebody run out in traffic and get hit by a car you know, we, we don't have to go try that for ourselves to find out if that's what's going to happen. Right. We should be able to just look at somebody else's life, look at like they did, like God is telling them, look, you've seen these other nations that don't follow me, that are following gods of silver and, and wood and, and, and gold and, and idols carved at a man, by man's hand. And the things that that leads to, you've seen their abominations is what he calls it. Calls it. And what is he saying? That makes you all the more accountable because you know that's not the, what God would have you to do. And he says in verse 18, Lest there should be among you uh, a man or a woman or tribe whose heart turneth away from the Lord our God to go serve other gods of these nations. So that's part of the purpose that God had brought them through that land to see all those things. So that it they would, their hearts, they would take warning, they would take heed to that, lest, that lest their hearts would turn. Lest there should be among you any root that beareth gall and wormwood. And we'll talk about that last part there. That's pretty interesting, but... You know, them having seen all these things, you know, they made them more accountable. And the covenant that Moses is giving here in Deuteronomy, you know, the words that Moses is speaking, all these, you know, all the, they were all spoken, all these things have happened, all these things have taken place to prevent Israel from going astray. You know, Moses isn't just talking to them because, you know, they're just killing time before they go over. You know, there's purpose behind everything that he's saying. You know, and the purpose is, is that they, when they get over there, they're not going to become disobedient. They're not going to become puffed up in, in their wealth and prosperity and go astray. And that's why he's speaking all these things. That's why God's let him saying all these things. But what's interesting is that this turning away from God, this going after false gods, this erring, you know, where does it begin? It begins, it shows us here, it begins in the heart. It says, uh, lest there be among you man or woman or, or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God. You know, that's where it always begins, is in the heart. When people start to get, get out of sorts with God, when they get away from God, when they, as it goes on and says here, when they get bitter, when they have gall and bitterness, you know, gall is another, and wormwood, these are all words that are, you know, uh, you know associated with uh, bitterness. Where does that begin with a person? It begins with their heart. You know, they hear, they hear something from the Bible or, or somebody does something that offends them and, you know, they, they, they take that and it, and it begins to fester and it turns into bitterness and it begins in the heart. And that's why we really need to, you know, guard our hearts against these things. <clears throat> but bitterness there, or what I believe is referring to using the word gall, right? He says, lest there be a root among you, a root that beareth gall, and wormwood, you know, that gall, um, uh, this bitterness, it is, I believe, directed towards God's commandments. That's what the bitterness is. And that's what he's, he's saying here. Look, you, you've seen what the abominations of, of, the, of the heathen, you've seen my protection and everything I've done for you, so don't get an attitude when I tell you to keep my commandments. You know, because 
let's face it, God's commandments, you know, they go against the grain quite often, right? Because we have a fallen nature. You know, God's law is actually what condemns us. The commandments, you know, you know show us how f- much we come up short. Does that mean we should just not even bother with them? No, of course not. Now, we know we don't keep them to get saved, but we keep them so that, again, God can bless us. But a lot of times, you know, the, it's the Word of God that offends. It's the preaching of the Word of God that offends. And it's sometimes, you know, if we're not careful, we can actually develop a bitterness in our heart towards the very Word of God, towards the commandments of God. I believe that's what he's showing us here, is that he's warning them, look, all these things have fallen out onto you so that you don't get bitter, because what's he keep, what's he keep just reiterating throughout this book? Keep the commandments, keep the commandments, obey the Lord, obey the Lord, obey the Lord, just over and over and over and over and over again, because he doesn't want them to get bitter. And that, that the, excuse me, the, the, the possibility, with that being the case, of, of this commandment to obey, you know, there's a strong possibility that some people will just be like, well, I'm tired of obeying. I'm tired of keeping the commandments. You know, why can't we go live like these people? Why can't we go run around and do it? You know, this is something I believe that happens with, you know, sometimes with young people in a church. You know, they come up in a church like this that preaches the whole word of God, says you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't fornicate, you shouldn't get involved in this sin and that sin. You should be careful who your friends are. And, you know, and, if, and if young people aren't careful, they feel like they look out in the world and they say, well, we're missing out. You know, the world is having all this fun. They're getting to do this. They're going to do that. And all, but, but what they don't understand is all they see is, is, is the shiny side of sin. All they see is the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, no one, no, the world isn't going to show you all the nastiness that comes with sin. They're not going to flaunt that. They're not going to flaunt the abortion that they had. They're not going to flaunt, you know, the, uh, the, the, the child out of wedlock. They're not going to flaunt, you know, everything that comes along with being a drunk. They're not going to flaunt, you know, the DUI or the, 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 the trouble with the law. They're not going to show you all that. They're going to show you everything that's shiny and bright and try to lure you in. And if we're not careful, if we don't take heed to the Word of God, you know, especially with young people too, they can become bitter with God and with His commandments and with the preaching. And, they can, and, a, and a root of bitterness can take hold and it can spread. And that's what we see here. <clears throat> So bitterness, I believe, is direct, that he's referring to is the bitterness that's directed toward God's commandments. It begins in the heart, but why does he call it wormwood? You know, that's a very interesting word. If you recall, it's used in Revelation. It's the star that comes from heaven and poisons a third of the waters and, and it kills uh, a, bat, you know, the, a huge number of the population. But why is it, so why is he using wormwood here? In fact, it it's comes up quite often in Scripture. And it's always, often, it's, it's, if you look it up, it's associated with gall, and it's associated with bitterness. And I believe the reason why he's using it is because it's something that spreads. If you recall in Revelation 8, you know, it's something that it hits the earth, and then whatever takes place, it causes this poison to spread throughout, you know, probably the groundwater, things like that. There's some interesting theories that are, that are out there that have a lot of merit to them, I believe. But I believe it's because it's a, it's a spreading type of thing. This wormwood is something that's going to spread throughout the earth. You know, it's not just going to be this all of a sudden thing, uh, you know, these people die. It's going to be something that takes place over time. It's a spreading, okay? And I believe that's why he's using it here. It's because, it, because bitterness and gall is something that, you know, it spreads to other people. <clears throat> if you would, go over to Hebrews chapter 12. I should have had you turn there either earlier, but... And that's why, you know, the New Testament warns us in Hebrew and Hebrews 12 to watch our hearts for the same bitterness, I believe. As I was talking about there, these people are being warned that they should not have uh, one, a root that beareth gall and wormwood. You know, don't, don't get, you know, envious at the wicked. Don't get uh, out of sorts with God. If, if you know, the, if, it's chap, if the Bible's chapping your hide a little bit, well, you know, maybe you're the problem, Okay. And that's what he's trying to warn them here. And you know, that's what we're warned of in the New Testament as well, that we have to be on guard just as much. Because here's the thing. There's no new thing under the sun. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. We're no different than these people back then. We had the same you know, heart of flesh. We had the same fallen nature. We could just as easily fall into any of these sins as anybody else. <clears throat> you know, and here's the thing. They had, I mean, look at everything they had. They had the fire come down. They had the blackness and darkness of smoke, the, the God's voice sounding long like a trumpet. 
the splitting of the Red Sea. I mean, they saw all these things within two generations. They saw God do all, I mean, the shoes on their feet every day were a reminder of God's provision, that, they, that God was real, that he was there. They had all these things, you know, uh, bearing witness and testimony and should have been reminding them of the Lord their God and kept them accountable. And yet they still fell. Now, do we have any of those things today? Only in the form of the written word. So how much more so should we be on guard today if this can happen to somebody who saw all of those things? If bitterness and gall can creep into their hearts, it's something that could just as easily happen to us, if not more so. That's why it says there in Hebrews 12, verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Look here, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. So again, there's that, 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 uh, you know, that, that, that wormwood-like effect, that spreading effect. You know, it springs up in one of us, and then if we're not careful, it can spread to other people. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Now, a couple things here about Hebrews 12. You know, notice, first of all, he says it's a root, right? And that's what he said back there in, in Deuteronomy 2. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall. And it's interesting that he used that. And, and he says in Hebrews 12, he says, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you. you know, and I thought about this often whenever I read this, exactly why he used that analogy of a root springing up. You know, and, I always, and I've wondered, I said, why doesn't God just tell us to go dig up the root and get it out of there? That's not what he says here. He says, watch the root, and if it springs up, you know, cut it down. Because here's the thing, that root has to be continually pruned because it's always going to be there. You know, we, we, because of the fact that we have two natures within us, you know, we have a fallen nature and we have the Holy Spirit. And these things are at war one with another, right? We, we, we can walk in the Spirit, we can walk in the flesh, but we will always have, until we reach glory, this fallen nature. So we're always going to have this potential to become bitter towards the things of God. And I believe that's why he calls it a root. And I believe that's why he doesn't tell you to go after the root. He says, watch the root. And if it springs up, you know, then you do something about it. Because that root is always going to be there, under the surface, always there. Maybe it's not bearing fruit. Maybe it's not, you know, blooming in our life. But the potential's there. If we water it, you know, if we nourish that root of bitterness, you better believe it's going to spring up. And, and here's the thing. Sometimes that happens. People nourish that plant. And what happens, like the wormwood, right, it spreads and many are defiled. How does that happen? Well, sometimes people get bitter and angry, let's say in a church setting. They don't, there's something the preacher said or whatever, they get offended. And instead of just leaving quietly and going on their, about their life, they're going to see how much trouble they can cause before they get, you know, thrown out or whatever. And they just, they, they'll water the bitterness in their life. They'll just, they'll, they'll take that root of bitterness and put it in a pot and put it in the, the best part of their garden. They'll put fertilizer on it. They'll make sure it gets the right amount of sun. And they'll let that thing just bloom in their life. And then once they got it just the way they like it, what they'll start to do is invite other people over and say, oh, here's my roses, here's my tulips, and here's my root of bitterness. Let me tell you about it. And what they look for is they try to get somebody's ear in the church, and they start to try to spread that bitterness into other people. Well, what do you think? I mean, do you really think that was the right decision? Or why did the pastor say this? Or... Did you notice this about, you know, and that's usually an attack on the pastor, right? Because that's, you know, that's just the way it is. I can't tell you why. Or an attack on his family. You know, they'll start to criticize, and they'll do it very subtly. They'll do it very slyly. But what are they doing? They're spreading. They got that plant of bitterness. They, they've not pruned it. That root has just bloomed in their life, and now it's just pollen. You're trying to pollinate everybody else's heart with it, and it spreads. <laughs> so it's a real interesting use of words there. And the fact that he uses in Deuteronomy and Hebrews 12, a lot of the same language, talking about how, you know, bitterness, gall, is a spreading, you know, a root that grows and spreads and affects everybody around them. And that's why we have to, uh, you know, keep on guard about it in our lives. And we should never listen to, you know, people who are trying to sow discord among the brethren. <laughs> those things should not be, we should never give ear to a bitter tongue. And we should learn to listen for it and, and recognize it when we hear it and say, look, I'm not going to hear that. You know, you need to get your heart right. So anyway, that was uh, just kind of an interesting little pit stop along the way here through the chapter. But if you want to go back to Deuteronomy 
We'll pick it back up at 19. And it says, and it shall, and it came to, excuse me, verse 19, and it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he blesseth himself in his heart. So what is he talking about again? You know, backing up the verse 16 about, you know, someone whose heart turns away from the Lord our God and, and to serve other gods. And then this guy is so presumptuous, you know, it says in verse 19 that it came to pass that he heareth the words of this curse, you know, chapter 20, uh, 28 that we read last week, you know, 64 verses, the vast majority of it was just curse, 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 curse. It was like twice as many cursings as blessings. And he says, oh, he hears the words of this curse. He understands everything that, God, that the preacher's saying, that the word of God is saying, about all the things that God uh, will do in a person's life or the punishment, the chastisement, it is there, that is real. And he blessed himself in his heart anyway. He says he hears the words and he says, yeah, but you know, that's not, is God really like that? Oh, that's just, that's just the preacher's take on it. You know, uh, that, that's not really the way God is. I, and he says, he blessed himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart. You know, I'm not going to be held down by God's rules. I'm not going to let his commandments, you know, keep me back from doing whatever I want to do. I'm going to walk whatever, whatever imagination in my heart there is to do. That's what I'm going to do, and I'll be at peace. You know, I, I understand what the Bible says, but, it, you know, it doesn't really matter to me. It's I'm different. I'm special. And he says, and, uh, to add drunkenness to thirst, the Lord will not spare him. But, the, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. So again, what do we see again? This, this theme of somebody knowing better and doing wrong anyway. Somebody who's, who is, is, is held to a degree of accountability and God coming down even more harshly upon them. You know, if this was somebody that was just completely ignorant of the word of God, if this was somebody that had never heard of the God of Israel, had never read the Bible, never knew any of these things, I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're innocent, but I'm saying that God might not you know, cause his jealousy to smoke against that man. God doesn't just do that to everybody. Where, what, is he, what is he saying? It's his jealousy that's smoking against him. It's him looking at that man who's saying, oh, I understand what God's commandments are. I'm going to walk the imagination of my own heart anyway. One of his children, one of his people, he's jealous for them. He says they're mine. And the Bible tells us that we are bought with a price. Ye are not your own. You are bought with a price as the precious blood of a lamb. And we should not, you know, be so careless to think that, just be, you know, that, that we can just do whatever we want in our life and God's not going to get jealous after his son shed his blood for us. After he gave his only begotten son and paid that ransom for our soul, that God's just going to say, well, you know, you just do whatever you want now. And there's no consequences. No, friend. If we, if we you know, understand the things of God, if we're saved and we become more accountable and we think we're just one day going to get bitter and angry and leave and just quit church and, every, and, and, and life's just going to be normal, I, you know, I'll be honest. You know, there's been seasons in my life where, seasons in my life where I've thought about tossing in the towel. You know what kept me in? The fear of God. To knowing that if I were to go back out there, I, whatever I, however I might, good of think it might be, it'll probably be 10 times worse than it's ever been. <laughs> because I've been made accountable, because I have sat on the preaching of the Word of God, because I have read the Bible, because I know these things, and I knew that the anger of the Lord would smoke against me. You know, and, and that far outweighs any desire to do any sinful thing. To, to, that fear should, should, uh, should, should far outweigh any, our desire to go out and commit sin. And it says, And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him. You, know, I, you don't want God as your enemy. You know, that's, that's intense. And he goes on, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Okay? <clears throat> this is a very severe uh, set of consequences for people who know the Lord's will and do it not. Okay? <clears throat> Again, the blessing of being God's people, right? It's the provision. It's the protection. It's the peace that passeth all understanding that God gives to his people when we know the Lord. right? But let's not forget that it comes with a greater deal of accountability to be God's child. And it also becomes with a greater severity to those uh, of punishment to those that are going to be disobedient. You know, the, being God's child is, is a two-edged sword. It's really nice to have the blessing and have the, the protection and the provision and all that. But at the, other, the flip side of that is now we're more accountable. And now any punishment is going to be even more severe. Look at verse 21. And the Lord shall separate, him out, uh, uh, se separate unto him evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law. 
so that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which is the Lord hath laid upon it. So he's saying, look, if you guys get out of sorts with me, you know, if this nation goes astray, I'm going to bring strangers from another land. And we go on and read here that they're going to mock you. They're going to wonder at it. You're not going to be a light unto all nations. You're going to be a, a cursing. You're going to be a byword, is what the Bible teaches us elsewhere. But notice he says there that he, it is the sickness which the Lord layeth upon it. Now, of course, we could certainly make application with that today, right? When God lays sickness upon a land. That is a punishment that God gives. You know, and, and, and that's something that's been preached very recently from this pulpit. I believe in pastor's sermon last night, he talked about the fact that, you know, whatever you believe about this coronavirus, it's of God. Whether it's man-made or not, God allowed it to happen. And everything that's taking place, God allowed it to happen. God is the one that lays sickness upon the land that is disobedient. And I believe that's exactly what we see today. That's what's going on. You say, well, how is it? How can it be that way? Because God is punishing this nation. Why? Because they knew better. Because they had the word of God. Because they weren't just some heathen nation that were going to suffer the consequences of their, of their sinful ways in and of themselves. They weren't, just didn't have the inherent punishment of sin. They actually had the word of God. They were accountable. They knew the things of God. And they, dis, they, they disregarded them. And then God's going to say, okay, well, now I'm going to punish you. I'm going to lay some sickness upon your land. That's the same way it is in this country. Now, I'm not... You know, get up here and tell you that every that our every founding father, you know, and every person, you know, the, the all the way back to the pilgrims was, you know, just this independent, fundamental, saved Baptist. But here's the thing: this nation, you know, was sending out missionaries all across the globe through the 1800s. I mean, this this nation is a nation that has had the light of the gospel in it, that has had the name of Jesus in every every state, every city. This was at one time a very Christian nation. And it has gone away from that. So should it really surprise us that when we have the light of the word of God in, in our midst and then we disregard it, when we kick God out of the public square, it should it really be a shocker if God lays the sickness upon our land? And I'm telling you, you know, we're going to go on here and read this, you know, picking it back up in verse 23. This, this coronavirus, and I said this again, I believe last week, is a slap on the wrist from God. I mean, it's, it's definitely not the easiest thing, but... It could be a lot worse. It could be a whole lot worse than what it is. I mean, look at verse 23. And that the whole land thereof is brimstone. I mean, God just burns their land, right? And is salt and burning that is not sown, that, uh, that is not sown nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein. <clears throat> like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. I mean, that's how bad it can get for a nation. I mean, this, this is nothing. You know, everyone's upset because, you know, Trump sent us a stimulus check, and they're up in arms, you know, and, and, and people are really, and I, I get it. You know, people, there's, I understand. I'm not making light of the things that people are going through. And it is inconvenient, and it's not fun, but it's nothing compared to what, quite honestly, what this nation really deserves. You know, and, and, and everyone is upset, and I understand why about, you know, the, 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 our rights that are being violated and things like that. If you want to make that argument, I'm not going to say that, you know, I understand that perspective. I really do. But here's my question, you know, and I, and I believe Brother Segura, we, he's even brought this up to me, was that, well, do we even deserve the rights that we have to begin with? I mean, what were we doing with them anyway? You know, what were we doing with all these, these rights that we, we cherish and love with the, in this country? You know, a lot of people were doing a lot of wicked things. And this country's gotten very backslidden, very wicked, very evil. I mean, do we really even deserve to have those rights anymore to begin with? Or do we deserve this? Sickness. And, they, you know, that is what's going to come one day. You know, mark it down. Maybe not in our lifetime, but if God's not, you know, he's not going to just let this go on forever and ever. God punishes a nation, and all the more severely when that nation has had the word of God in it. It makes them more accountable, not less. <clears throat> and he says in verse 25, The men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God, their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. It's funny, the stranger gets it. The stranger understands. You know, the foreigner, the, the, the heathen looks at it and goes, Oh, that's because they forsook their God. But the people that are living there going through it, they don't get it. They can't connect the dots. 
So, because here's the thing. You have to remember, you say, well, that sounds harsh. I mean, he's going to overthrow them like Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, brimstone and salt and burning? I mean, hmm, lighten up, Lord. I mean, is it really that big of a deal? But here's the thing. They didn't forsake just anybody. You know, they didn't, I mean, these, if we recall, we know the story of Israel. This eventually happens. You know, God punishes them severely, takes them out of the land. I mean, you know, just the, the horrors that we read in, in, in the previous chapter last week. Of, of the things that people had had to resort to, literal cannibalism taking place. Um, you know, why is it? Why did that all happen? Because they didn't forsake just anybody. They forsook the Lord God that delivered them, the God that did all these things for them. That's who they forsook. You know, they didn't forsake, you know, some wooden statue. They didn't forsake some golden idol. They forsook the Lord of heaven, the true and living God. Look at verse 26. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not, and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring it upon all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into their, another land as it is this day. I mean, that's, that's who they forsook, the Lord that, that delivered them from Egypt. And now verse 29, you know, the last verse, I, I really like this verse. And I, I feel like this verse just really summarizes, you know, Deuteronomy. It really summarizes this book and just kind of puts it in a nutshell. It says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So, again, you can see the, 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 the message of accountability there that, hey, there's secret things that, that belong unto only God, but you know what? There are things that we do know, and they belong unto us, and we need to teach them to our children. They belong unto them. And what's the purpose of them, of God having given them unto us, that, that we could call them our own, that we may do all the words of this law? It's not enough just to have them. You know, it's not enough to just to know what to do. You actually have to go and do it. And what I like about this, too, is that, and again, that's really, you know, that's the book of Deuteronomy in a nutshell. God's given us these commandments so that we might do them. That's it. You know, I mean, you say, why did God write, you know, Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers? Why did he go through all that telling of the law over? Why did he repeat it so often? So you do it. So you do it. So they would do it. So that God could bless them. Because God has, you know, a way he wants things done and, and, and so on and so forth. But really, another great thing about this verse that I love is that it shows us that, you know, there are some things we're never going to fully understand about the Lord. There's some things about the Bible we're just never really going to get that we'll have to get to heaven before God opens up our understanding. You know, and there's probably things that we can, can learn, uh, maybe things we don't understand today that we will learn one day, you know, as we read and study and hear preaching and so on and so forth. But even, even after a lifetime of study, there's just going to be secret things that belong unto God that we can sit there and wonder about and we can question and we can get in conversations and ask each other questions. What do you think about this verse? What do you think about this chapter? What do you think this means? What if this? And here's the thing. We'll never come to a solid answer. Because there's some things in the Bible that just belong unto God. There's some things about the Lord and the way, the way he does things that just, they're secret. They belong unto him. But here's the thing. There's no sense in focusing on those things. Because you'll never, you'll never know them. And, and, and here's, here's the thing. We have plenty on our plate to begin with. You know, people want to get over here into this, this minutia of, of some strange, you know, obscure verse, some dark saying in the scripture that no one's really figured out yet, and they just leave this whole, everything that is just crystal clear, completely undone. You know, and, and a great example of this is the many emails that we receive here at the church. You know, I read emails of people, they just want to know just the most intricate you know, depths of, of, you know, Daniel's 70th week and so on. They want to understand some, you know, obscure Bible passage and then they find out they don't go to church, they don't go soul winning, they're not, they have no desire to do that, you know, or, or they just, they're just, they're focusing, they're, you know, they're, they're straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel, as the saying goes, right? There's secret things, just let them be the secret things. We'll get to that, maybe. And if not, we've got plenty to deal with. I mean, Deuteronomy is a long book, and there's a lot of practical teaching in it. And there's a lot of other books in this Bible that, that we need to know and things that we need to apply to our lives. 
So there's no sense focusing on the secret things that belong only unto our God. We've got plenty on our plate. You know, there's a full meal that we have to, 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 to digest here. <clears throat> so why has God, you know, given us the Bible? Why has God given us biblical preaching? And why has God given us the Holy Spirit and the ability to understand all of these things? Why did he give Deuteronomy? Like it says there, that we may do all the words of this law. <laughs> and uh, that's really the message tonight. You know, it, it, and really that's the message of Deuteronomy. Is I'm telling you these things so that you'll do them. And the, and the theme, I believe, of this book is blessing through obedience. And also on the flip side, cursing through disobedience. So it's not, you know, and the great, great promises in this chapter, you know, that we're God's chosen people, you know, that, that, that all nations can come unto him. That's not just this, this particular group of people at that time, that God opened up, you know, that, 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 that way in to people that weren't even there yet, to generations afar off that we could have by faith Abraham for our father, that we could be the children of faith through Christ. That's a great message. But, you know, just proclaiming ourselves to be God's people is not enough. You know, we have to also live like the Lord's people. That's believe that's what God, because that's what God wants for his people. You know, and if you live for God, you know, you won't have to go around proclaiming it to everybody. You know, living for the Lord, that speaks volumes enough in and of itself. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again, thank you for the privilege to be called your people. Thank you that you've made that way uh, to you through the blood of Christ, Lord, that there's nothing we have to do other than believe. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to live for you. Lord, not, not to just um, disregard the things of the word of God, but that we would apply these things to our life. And Lord, help us to guard our hearts against the root of bitterness. Lord, we all have this fallen nature and we know that there's gonna be things that we read or hear that offend us, that, that hit close to home. Lord, I pray you'd help us to have uh, a tender heart. You'd help us to have a humble spirit, Lord, that we would receive correction when it's due. And Lord, that we would not allow bitterness to spring up and defile many. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Pray that you would just uh, keep us safe as we go. We ask in Christ's name, amen. All right, thanks for coming, everybody. We are dismissed.